And you're welcome back to The Breakfast on PLOS TV Africa. Let's now uh, begin with uh, taking a look at the papers uh, that are making headlines this morning. Uh, beginning with the Nigerian Tribune, it says, Bring repentant Boko Haram insurgents to trial. ACF tells federal government, that's the Arawa Consultative Forum. And Masari tells citizens, arm yourselves against bandits. How Anambra Ogun Imu Edo Eboyi abandoned over 10 billion naira UBE fund with UBEC. 36 state attorneys general Sue Malami over recovered funds remittance. Buhari security chiefs meet tomorrow. Governors move to end resident doctors nationwide strike. Federal government to end 774,000 special public works program beyond 2021. More stories in the Tribune. Community mourns as seven members of same family found dead in Oshun State. One shot, many injured, shops looted as court groups clash in Lagos. Police snap banker for allegedly siphoning 10 million naira from customers' accounts in Oyo State. PIA, host communities got fair deal. That's according to the federal government. NNPC goes commercial in six months. Sector deregulation now constitutional. Petrol pump price remains 162 naira per litre. And now moving on to the Punch newspapers. Signing of PIB. Buhari bowed to majority wish, says Aso Rock. South South blames lawmakers. President not insensitive, but responsive to the yearnings of majority of Nigerians. And that's from his aide. Uh, South South National Assembly members ignored their people, voted for party, says the governor's aide. Also on the punch, Naira abusers risk six months in, in jail as CBN gives fresh warning. Federal government owes CBN 15.51 trillion Naira, borrows 14.86 trillion Naira under Buhari. ACF faults reintegration of repentant Boko Haram members, says it's injustice. And also Buhari, Obasanjo, others mourn as Mantu dies of COVID-19. Minister, FIIRO FII board differ over staff promotion. And uh, an interesting one that broke yesterday, court freezes bank accounts of forex trading platforms. Stop um, election preparations and referendum must hold, Akintoye and others say. Um, we can see just uh, one more here that I would share. It says, uh, federal government meets NMA as NGF discusses Nigerian doctor strike today. Those are the stories that we can share on the punch. Um, let's take a look at the Nation newspaper. Governors peak six hoes in Petroleum Industry Act. And it says, oil industry law, a recipe for disaster. Air peace inaugurates Abuja Ibadan route. Just killings. Akiri Delu visits families. Silver says deregulation coming after talks. And let market forces determine petrol price. Also on the Nation newspaper, Ogun Ekiti, 24 others failed to assess Ubec 29.3 billion naira cash. PDP plans new plaintiffs in suit seeking Bunis sack. CBN, Naira abusers for prosecution. Inflation fell to 17.38%. Food prices rose in July. Recovered 2.28 trillion naira loot. States ask federal government to give account. Buhari governor's others mourn ex-deputy Senate president, Mantu. And on The Guardian, despite PIA, federal government to retain subsidy, sell petrol at 162 naira. Insist allocations to host communities and frontier development justifiable. A, a law not perfect, but a good start, APC admits. And also why insurgency uprising thrive, and that's by Obasanjo. Our increasing population keeps me awake at night, he also says. Still on The Guardian this morning, repentant Boko Haram members deserve no, uh, no pity, Arewa leaders tell federal government. The problem with Northern Nigeria by Jaga, Makafi and others. International fund recoveries not governed by local laws, Malami clarifies. And also protect yourselves against banditry, Masari tells Katsina residents. Still on The Guardian, APC deploys 23 governors to tackle ABGA and others in Anambra gubernatorial. Good morning to Mr. Ademola Akingbala, the publisher of the Podium Media. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me again. Good morning. Good morning. All right. Um, I think the big one that we can start with is the response from the Arewa Consultative Forum. 
with regards uh, repentant Boko Haram members and the government forgiving them, I guess. Um, what's your um, uh, take on that? Okay. Um, quite frankly, I have no problem with the uh, government decided to forgive repentant terrorists, but they must first serve the punishment for their crime. Okay. When someone has committed an offense and all you do is just to pardon their tenants that he or she will go back to that crime. So they should be punished, okay? maybe mild, mild punishment. Then they should be reintegrated in a strategic way. You, you, you don't just say, go and see no more. Okay? They need to know that there's consequences for any action they take subsequently. So I, I, my own position is that, yes, pardon people if they've shown enough remorse but let them face consequences of their action. Because if you don't do that, you are setting a dangerous precedent for others. So we say, okay, let me go and commit the same crime. At the end of the day, I will be forgiven. What, what would so, you describe as mild punishment? Mild punishment is if the um, if you are supposed to go to jail for 20 years, for instance, and you show an enough remorse, then you can get maybe 10 years, okay? Or, 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 or even five years. Yeah, but, but, program, but Mr. Kimbola, yes. can, can an armed yes. robber, can a murderer, can anybody who's accused of anything, who shows enough remorse, get the same mild punishment? That would absolutely depend on the, on, on, on the legal system, really. But underlying what I'm saying is that no matter how remorseful you feel, you must feel the consequences of your action. Okay, If you commit an offense, you must face the law. In the process of serving the punishment, some measures can be put in place to say, okay, it's show remorse. We've seen evidence that we won't do it again. Because really, when we punish people, okay, the essence is to reform them. Okay? The essence of um, getting people to go to the court to face trial is so that they can repent, they can be reformed. It's not to destroy them. Okay? So the legal system is not out to be punitive but reformating. So in between the two, we've got to strike a balance. You want to punish people for what they've done, but you also want to make sure that those who are generally repented are reintegrated into the system in a very careful manner. Because some people will pretend, okay, that they have shown remorse. And if you rush into pardoning them, uh, reintegrating them, then you, then you are going to be reinforcing that criminal heart. So yes, it, it, it's something that needs to be looked into, but with, with, with a lot of um, discretion and with, 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 with a lot of um, uh, highs on the ball, okay? Realizing the fact that other people are watching, other people are watching and they want to see how this issue will be handled. So my position is that, yes, pardon people, but not a blanket pardon. Let them still face the consequence of their action, okay? And in the process of serving a sentence or facing the punishment, an arrangement can be worked out that will, that, that will mitigate okay, that punishment and make sure that we begin to uh, bring them back into society. So that's, that's, that's my position. Okay. The petroleum industry bill is a very big issue right now, and we see it across the papers yeah. on the punch. Um, we're seeing, um, you know, but a story here that says Buhari bowed to majority wish, that's according to Asarok, and the South South blames lawmakers. When we go to the Nation newspaper, it says governors pick six holes in Petroleum Industry Act. So even though, you know, there's lots of commendation you know, for President Muhammad Buhari's, you know, ascent of the bill after about 20 years on the walks, the um, controversy there still remains about some sections of the of the bill, which still leaves it at 3%, you know, for host communities, you know, against the initial 10 they asked for, the 30% for oil exploration and all these other things. So regarding this uh, um, uh, particular bill, governors have said it's a recipe for disaster and that even if we hail this as, yes, it's given a regulatory framework for, you know, the oil industry in Nigeria, that the, the, the law is basically dead on arrival and that the world is moving on to fossil fuels and all of that. How do you interpret, you know, these concerns? Uh, yes, I would like to take off your last statement that is dead on arrival. Indeed, it is dead on arrival. And here, I want to put on record that National Assembly has been a monumental failure and a sort of issue disappointment to a lot of Nigerians. Where you have representatives of the people, 
who prefer to vote across party lines and do not care about the wishes of who they represent, then there's no other name to call them, but they just been a big disappointment. Okay, where were the governors when the representatives were agreeing to this bill? Hmm. You can't blame the president. Something has been presented to him by the majority of the National Assembly. He has to sign. So I want to believe that during the discussions, those reps and those senators they decided to ignore the wishes of the people. They decided to sideline their governors, to sideline their constituencies. And now the bill has been signed into law. What are we going to do? It's going to be implemented. Then, of course, there will be a backlash. Of course, there will be a crisis. Of course, there will be resistance. And the question is that why can't we just get things right in Nigeria? Why can't we do things the way things should be done? For every House of Press member, your mandate is to represent the wishes of the people, not your own party, not your own personal opinion. So I expected them to go back to their states, hold consultations, and be able to present, aggregate the, 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 the opinion of the people, present them to, 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 to on the floor of National Assembly. They have not done that. What they've done is just to sit quietly in Abuja and decided to vote across party lines. And that's what this city has been doing. Okay? There's nothing wrong in the National Assembly supporting the executive arm. But that support must be reasonable, it must be sensible, and it must be in line with the wishes of the people. Okay, Mr. Akimbala, I, I, want to, I want to take you up on the last statement you made, right? We discussed this PIB yeah. yesterday, and one of the questions I asked our guests was, why does it seem like when you take a look at the bills that are being signed in Nigeria, it seems that, you know, many Nigerians are aggrieved, you know. There are points of those bills that a particular section of the country do not agree with. But rather than have those issues resolved before it goes ahead to become law, you know, we find that, you know, they just go ahead and pass the bills. So it now seems that we have lots of laws that the people do not agree with. They claim that they were not consulted and their own grievances were not addressed before those, in those laws or those bills were signed, right? So when we now take a look at the PIB, for instance, you know, that guest of yesterday said that there can never be a perfect law in Nigeria. Do you think that's what it is? We are not looking for perfection. We are looking for adequate and sensible representation. Mm. No system is perfect all over the world. But why don't we have such problems in the US, in the UK, in other developed countries? Simply because there is extensive consultation. Those who have been elected to go to Abuja to represent their constituencies, they have failed the people. These are issues that have been taken care of at the grassroots level. Most of them preferred to, 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 to open up with ASORO, collect money, okay, at the risk of satisfying the mandate that has been given to them. So it's not about a perfect law. It's about a just, fair, and equitable law that will represent the wishes of the people. That's all we're asking for. We're asking for a law that up to 90% represents what the people want. So I'm a rep member in Abuja. And I have to go back to my constituency. I have to hold consultation. Grassroots so, so Mr. consultation Mr. Akimbal, Mr. All the way. But then why do you yes. then, why 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 do we then see a situation where we have laws that do not accurately represent the wishes of the people? Why? That's what I'm explaining. That those who are making the laws, they are not consulting with the people that the laws are being made for. Nobody does that. You don't shave someone's head in his absence. You are there to make laws. The people that would receive this law, the people that will implement the law, do they have input? No, they don't. And that's why we are where we are. The PIB has taken us 20 years to put together. And this is all that we can come up with. Hmm. It's shameful. All right. Because now well. you are going to have host communities that will resist. That will resist. If they ask for 10% and you are asked and, and you are proposing 3%, you have not met them. It's not even up to the percent of, of what they expected to do, okay? And now you are saying thirty percent of the profit of NAPC Limited will go into all exploration in the frontiers basin. Who decided and who agreed that these are the frontier bases that we're going to explore? Right. So these are issues. I'm saying, look, we these are things that, that are avoidable, but because the National Assembly has sold out, National Assembly has become a huge. Joke. They are just there to rubber stamp whatever the executive wants. And we will continue to have this problem unless the electorate begins to recall those that they have elected. 
if they do not exercise the power of the call, they're just wasting their time. Okay. It will continue to happen. The recall process yes. is also, you know, well, at least from what we've seen, also very, yeah. very, very difficult to pull through with. Um, I, I want to. It, 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 I want us to go into something okay, else. Um, sorry, uh, I want us to go into something else. Um, it's on the punch. It says uh, court freezes bank accounts of forex trading platforms. Um, it mentioned a few um, yesterday uh, that um, you know had um, had basically been accused of. Uh, doing illegal transactions, you know, with uh, FX. Um, the reactions to this have really been that Nigeria, you know, seems to be stifling the growth of, uh, you know, private businesses, you know, and the, the economy in different uh, regards. Uh, do you agree with the CBN here and with an ex parte order that freezes its accounts for six months? We need to know the facts of the case. We need to see the proof and the evidence before we can judge. Okay, there's no way the CBN will allow its laws to be to, to, to be to be um, to be abused or to be ignored or to be disobeyed. We need to know the fact of the case. And these guys can go to court, of course. They can appeal that decision. Okay. okay? Until we know Yes. Mr. Akima, the fact, the fact of the case here is that um, the courts here, the CBN here is saying, that, first of all, it, it's an order by the Federal High Court in Abuja. They froze the accounts of these companies. Um, they include Bamboo, Chaka, Trove, and Rise. You know, these are platforms that Nigerians used to invest you know, in foreign stocks and all of that. So they said that the CBN is saying that these guys did not get the appropriate license to operate as a risk management um, company. And that's why their accounts have been frozen. And um, that's for a period of 180 days. So these... Um, so, if, so if these guys got licenses, it should present licenses. Okay. That's why I said it's, very, it's a simple and straightforward matter. If the regulatory authority has, has found you wanting in a particular area, all you need to do is to show proof that you should not be punished. Okay, so don't let us go to the sentiment of oh, um, government is stifling business. No, let us know exactly what happened. Okay. Are they guilty or not? If they are yeah. not guilty, let, let them appeal that that that, that decision all the way to the Supreme Court. Yeah, and but, be you know, damages. So, so I think the yes. challenge, the challenge, you know, that I've seen from the response, um, uh, mostly online, is you know the um, ex parte order in the first place. You know, and the fact that the, the Nigerian government seems to have this same modus operandi of. Uh, getting court orders to take actions before they fully investigate. Uh, because now you've mentioned, you know, that there needs to be facts of the case. Um, and the government has not, you know, you know, outrightly pointed out these facts before asking that the, uh, the accounts be frozen for six months. Um, it's pretty much the same thing with the police arresting any person that they see on the street. And then while you're arrested, you find out your crime in the police station or, you know, then they start yeah, to search this, for, this, for reasons why you were arrested. These guys can go to court and ask for a stay of execution. They can ask for an interlocutory injunction that would not allow the CPN to execute that mandate. So what I'm saying is that let us exhaust all legal means before we know who is okay. right and who is wrong. Of course, the CPN will always use its power, sometimes in a repressive way. And I'm, I'm hoping that the judicial system will come to the aid of these companies to ensure that they are not being utterly punished. But hey, if they have been found to have flouted any law, then they should be punished. Because most of us investors, we don't even know what these guys do. Okay? We oh. don't know what they do. How they get their license, we don't even know. Okay? okay. So, let them go to court. Okay. I would not support the CBN trying to discourage people from investment. Everything that needs to be done has to be done by the law. That's, that's, that's it. All right, Mr. All right. Kimbala, um, there's a story on the Nation newspaper um, just uh, below the headline there that says, recovered 2.28 trillion Naira loot, state asked federal government to um, give account. Now, according to the story, the state governors have taken the federal government to the Supreme Court, challenging um, how the federal government has basically spent about 2.28 trillion Naira that had been recovered you know, from suspects. So they're saying that between 2015 and 2021, the federal government of Nigeria has recovered the sum of 1.8 trillion naira in cash and about 450 billion naira worth of non-cash assets. This state government, uh, governors also said that the federal government diverted this loot into the consolidated revenue accounts and other accounts that are not recognized by the constitution and that they want the federal government to actually come out and defend itself about this. So yeah. what do you say?
That, that's, that's the beauty of democracy. Okay? The courts are there to interpret. My own concern is the fading bottle mentality that the states have continued to display. Okay? Any state government who is serious about generating internal, uh, about developing states will not be dependent on Abuja. Okay? It's, it's okay for them to identify areas where the federal government has aired and to try to bring this um, into the public domain. Okay, but at the same time, at the same time, what does the law say? What does the law allow the federal government to do with looted funds? We need to know exactly what they should do. Okay, so at the end of the day, we have states who believe that at every opportunity they can either intimidate or blackmail the federal government to get him money. All right, and that's the mentality that I, I want them to really move away from. Okay, and as we've always said, most of our states are not viable. Okay, aside Lagos, Rivers, Delta, the oil producing states, all that are not viable. They're just struggling. Okay, so that's a matter for another day. But it will be interesting to know what the court, what the Supreme Court will come up with. So it's a good decision for the state. Um, I believe what they're doing, they're doing it on behalf of the people. Okay, they're wow. doing it on behalf of people for, for us to know exactly how the federal government is spending looted funds. However, going beyond that, I want this to move away from this pretty bottom mentality that money must always come from Abuja all the time. Mm. And this is not the first time that they are fighting the federal government. Every revenue that comes in, they want to fight. They want, yeah, we've talked about the kind of loose federation that we have. We, we, we've talked about the fact that the center is, is feeding fat on the state. All of these things should feed into the restructuring plan that we've been calling for. Okay, right, so Mr. Kimbola. we've gone back to the job research world. Yeah. All right, let's uh, wrap up with uh, you speaking uh, on the story in The Guardian that says, uh, and that's from Governor Masari, saying that residents should defend themselves against uh, bandits. It's uh, on The Guardian that says, protect yourselves against banditry, Masari tells Katsina residents. That's one of the indices of failed states. Okay? It is one of the symptoms of a governmental system that has failed is one of the evidences of an, uh, a situation whereby people have lost confidence. Because I've never seen any part of the world where a politician or, or a political leader is asking the people to defend themselves. So even in America, where people have the right to carry guns, license guns, government will never tell you to say, go on self-defense, unless it is absolutely necessary. So for Masari to say people should harm themselves, where morally what he's saying is right. Okay, morally, because you don't want to watch your people being killed. But legally, that's, that is an incitement, that's a call to anarchy. And under a state that works, the DSS should by now be speaking to Masari. Okay, because you, you, you can't incite people. There, there's a way that you can pass such a message across that people should be more security conscious, people should come up with a different arrangement to counter um, insecurity and all that, but you don't ask them to harm themselves. Well, In any way, well, the, statement says themselves, protect, where would they get the statement says protect yourselves. Where you protect yourself? Are you going to use your bare hands? No. You've got to look for arm and ammunition to protect yourself. You won't protect yourself by just getting a broom or stick, no, against someone who is carrying AK-47. Okay? So, that call, morally, yes, but legally, it is an open-ended call for anarchy. Okay? So, I, 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 I would expect him to temperate that or to moderate that person. Look, what I'm saying is that let us be more security conscious. Let's have vigilante groups. Let's have grassroots approach to security management. Let's have the state police. Those are things that we can do. But when you come out to say people should, people should protect themselves, it 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 it, it sounds so much to me. Oh. Sounds so much to me. Demola Kimbola, thank you very much for joining us so much, uh, Wednesday morning. And thank we wish you. you a very interesting day ahead. And you too. Thank you. Bye. All right. Stay with us. Uh, we'll take a short break. When we come back, we're going back in history uh, to tell you things that happened on this day. I'm going back to the year 1991. Hmm. And I'm going to about 121 years ago. Stay with us.